This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 97, for broadcast on the 16th of September 2022. Coming up on Space Time, the Solar Orbiter spacecraft hit by a massive coronal mass ejection, a new study shows Mars dryness runs deep, and new space travel health warnings. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Earlier this month, as the European Space Agency's solar orbiter undertook its third flyby of the planet Venus, it was slammed by a huge coronal mass ejection blasting out from the Sun. The powerful geomagnetic storm hit the spacecraft just two days prior to its closest approach to Venus. Scientists say the solar storm demonstrates why it's important to monitor space weather events. Now, fortunately, there were no negative impacts on the spacecraft, That's because it's designed to withstand and in fact measure violent outbursts from the Sun. Although Venus doesn't get off so lightly. You see, coronal mass ejections have a tendency of eroding Venus's atmosphere, stripping off gases as they stream by. Solar Orbiter is now a quarter of a way through its decade-long mission to observe the Sun close up and get a look at its mysterious poles. The spacecraft's orbit was chosen to be in close resonance with Venus, meaning it returns to the planet's vicinity every few orbits in order to use Venus's gravity to alter its own orbital trajectory. And this third flyby saw solar orbiter pass within 6,000 kilometres of the planet's surface. Its distance from Venus, angle of approach and velocity were all meticulously planned to get the exact desired effect from the planet's gravitational pull, slingshotting the probe into a new flight path that'll see it pass 4.5 million kilometres closer to the Sun than before. Mission managers are still evaluating the plethora of data coming from the probe following the event. The observations are showing how the local space environment changed as the giant coronal mass ejection swept by. While some instruments needed to be turned off during the close approach to Venus in order to protect them from stray sunlight reflected off the planet's surface, solar orbiters in situ instruments remained on, recording among other things an increase in solar energetic particles. Solar energetic particles are mostly protons, electrons and ionised atoms like helium, which are constantly streaming out of the sun in the solar wind. But when large solar flares and coronal mass ejections erupt, these particles are picked up and carried with them, accelerating them to near relativistic speeds. And at these sort of energies, these particles can damage delicate electronics on spacecraft or pose a real radiation threat to astronauts in orbit. They can also punch through the Earth's protective magnetic shield, affecting navigation and communication systems and even triggering power blackouts. This report... From ESA TV. Built by Airbus in the UK, engineers had the challenging task of designing a mission capable of observing the Sun as close as 42 million kilometres away, within the orbit of Mercury. The spacecraft has a number of key new technologies that have been developed just for the purpose of flying close to the Sun. We have a specific heat shield designed just for solar orbiter that will reach temperatures of over 500 degrees centigrade on the front side and will keep things as cool as just about 50 degrees centigrade on the backside to protect the sensitive electronics. The sun generates a bubble of plasma enveloping the entire solar system. Known as the heliosphere, anything within it, including Earth, is subject to a stream of charged particles called the solar wind. Violent space weather from flares and coronal mass ejections has the potential to damage satellites, disrupt communications and knock out power grids on the ground. Solar Orbiter will help answer fundamental questions about the Sun's activity. One of the key questions the scientists have is how the heliosphere is actually generated and how it's accelerated. So what is, what is really uh, driving the solar winds? And the second key question of the mission is understanding uh, what makes the sun change or vary over this 11-year cycle that we all know. So understanding the, uh, the magnetic properties of the sun and how these uh, change over this 11-year cycle is one of the key scientific objectives of Solar Orbiter. 
To measure the magnetic environment around the Sun, Solar Orbiter is fitted with extremely sensitive instruments. And to capture the closest ever pictures of our star, the heat shield has peepholes through it, covered by protective doors. We are going to places where no other solar telescopes have been before. We are going to be very close to the Sun to take very high resolution images of the Sun, unprecedented uh, spatial resolution. And we are also going to fly over the poles of the Sun, regions that are very much unknown because we don't see them very well from Earth, but they are the source of the fast solar wind and therefore are very important. To reach this orbit, Solar Orbiter will use the gravity of Venus and Earth over the course of several years. Solar Orbiter is building on the rich legacy of ESA's previous missions to the Sun, including Ulysses and SOHO. In orbit around our star for more than 20 years, SOHO is still returning spectacular images. This new solar mission will complement NASA's Parker Solar Probe, which launched last year. We will not get as close to the sun, but we will have a vastly bigger payload complement, so more instruments with more cameras looking at the sun. So we will do science that is complementary to Solar Probe, and the two will really have a great deal of synergy. Scientists and engineers have been working on ESA's Solar Orbiter mission for more than 20 years. They can now look forward to unravelling the mysteries of the sun. And in that report from ESA TV, we heard from ESA Solar Orbiter Project scientist Daniel Muller, ESA Solar Orbiter Project manager Cesar Garcia, and Solar Orbiter's principal investigator Frederick Auchia. This is Space Time. Still to come... A new study of the Martian equatorial region shows it's dry as a bone, and scientists are working on a new way to manufacture metals on Mars. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new analysis of seismic data from NASA's Mars InSight mission has revealed that the mission's equatorial landing site isn't just dry as a bone, but that dryness runs deep, with little or no subsurface ice down to at least 300 metres. The findings come as a surprise for scientists, who had previously found permafrost just below the Martian surface at higher latitudes. The study's lead author, Vishan Wright, from the University of California, San Diego, says he found that the red planet's crust was weak and porous, with sediments that are not well cemented. There's simply no ice, or at least not much ice, filling the poor spaces. The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, doesn't preclude there being small grains of ice, or at least small balls of ice, that aren't cementing other materials together. But the question is, how likely is ice to be present in that form? Another surprising find contradicts the leading idea about what happened to all the water on Mars. Scientists know Mars was once a warm, wet world with a thick atmosphere. But being a small planet, the molten Martian core began to solidify fairly early on. And with the core solidifying, the geomagnetic process, which creates a protective magnetic field around the planet, disappeared, allowing the planet's atmosphere and much of its water to be eroded away and degas into space. But many scientists suspect that a significant amount of the Martian water didn't degas, but instead soaked into the ground, becoming part of the minerals that make up a sort of underground cement. If you put water in contact with rocks, you produce a brand new set of minerals, like clay, so the water is no longer a liquid, but instead it's part of the mineral structure. Now, scientists did find some cement, but the rocks aren't full of it. Of course, water could also go into minerals that don't act as a cement. But Wright says the uncemented subsurface removes one way to preserve a record of life or biological activity if it ever existed on Mars. You see, cements by their very nature hold rocks and sediments together, protecting them from destructive erosion. The lack of cemented sediments suggests a water scarcity, at least in the 300 metres directly below InSight's landing site near the equator. The below freezing average temperature of the Martian equator means that conditions there would have been cold enough to freeze water were it there. Many planetary scientists have long suspected that the Martian subsurface would be full of ice, frozen as permafrost. 
but it seems those hopes have now melted away. Still, big ice sheets and frozen ground ice do remain at the Martian poles. And models suggest there still should be some frozen ground at the equatorial latitude, with aquifers underneath. The InSight spacecraft landed on Elysium Planitia, a flat, smooth plane near the Martian equator, in 2018. Its instruments included a seismometer designed to measure vibrations caused by Mars quakes and crashing meteorites. Scientists can tie this information to a huge mass of knowledge about the surface, including images of Martian landforms and temperature data. The surface data suggested the subsurface might consist of sedimentary rock and lava flows. Still, the team had to account for uncertainties about subsurface properties, such as porosity and mineral content. And seismic waves from Mars quakes provide clues as to the nature of the minerals they're travelling through. Possible cementing minerals, such as clays, calcites, gypsum and kaolinite, affect seismic velocities. The author supplied rock physics computer modelling to interpret the velocities derived from the InSight data. They then ran their models 10,000 times each in order to get uncertainties incorporated into their analysis. But the simulation showed a subsurface consisting mostly of uncemented material best fitted the data. Scientists want to probe the subsurface of the red planet because if life exists on Mars, that's where it's likely to be. You see, there's no liquid water on the surface and subsurface life would be protected from radiation. Following the upcoming sample return mission, NASA's priority for the next decade is a Mars Life Explorer mission concept. The goal will be to drill at least two metres into the Martian crust at high latitude in order to search for signs of past or present life, where ice, rock and the atmosphere all come together. Already under consideration is the proposed International Robotic Mars Ice Mapper mission, which would help NASA identify potential scientific goals for the first human missions to the Red Planet. This report from NASA TV. InSight has been fantastically successful. We've gotten more science than we had ever dreamed that we would get during the course of this mission. InSight's primary goal was to better understand how the terrestrial planets, the rocky planets, uh, formed and evolved. First, we landed an incredibly sensitive seismometer on the surface of Mars, and with that, we are able to record over 1,300 Mars quakes. And these range all the way from tiny little temblers that just barely go over the noise background to a handful of quakes that were larger than magnitude four. And feeling those vibrations, the scientists can actually take that information and use that to reconstruct all the material that those Mars quakes traveled through and thereby see the interior of the planet. We looked at its core, which is big and not very dense. We looked at its mantle, which is not so hot. And we looked at its crust, which is not too thick and not too dense compared to some of our pre-mission expectations. By measuring the detailed structure of the inside of Mars, it gives us a snapshot of what the planet looked like four and a half billion years ago. The other thing that we've been able to do is make a very detailed record of the weather at Mars. So we have a really good weather station, which has allowed meteorologists to study the, the weather at the, at the InSight landing site and relate that to the climate changes on Mars. What we didn't do, unfortunately, was make the heat flow measurement we wanted to make. Our heat flow probe was supposed to get three to five meters down, and we were unable to reach that depth. But we were able to get some of those measurements, such as the heat transfer amongst the soil. InSight is a solar-powered mission. We have solar panels, and they were designed to give us enough power to easily get through the first two years. But there's a lot of dust in Mars' atmosphere, and that's falling down on top of our solar arrays and slowly blocking the sun. As the panels are getting dustier, we started racking our brains with whether there's anything we can do to try to clean off those panels ourselves. When the idea of using dirt to clean the solar arrays was first proposed, it seemed counterintuitive. We were actually able to use the arm and the scoop to scoop up some soil from the ground and dump it over the lander, having some of that heavier sand blow onto the arrays and knock some of the dust off. So we essentially used it as an array cleaning tool. Cleaning with dirt actually worked. It allowed us to actually keep the instruments going during the low power season where the, the Mars is farthest from the sun during the winter. 
Unfortunately, later this summer, we think that the power is going to be dropping so quickly due to uh, the atmosphere getting dustier, due to the uh, alignment of Mars and the Sun. We're going to be at a point where we can no longer have all of our instruments on, which means we'll be turning off the seismometer and other instruments on board. The last day is going to be bittersweet. Uh, obviously, we're preparing for it. We know it's coming. But that first moment where we don't hear from the lander when we expect to, that's going to be tough. Uh, it's left a permanent mark on me. We've really rewritten sort of the, the chapter of the encyclopedia on the interior of Mars. That was our last big hole in our understanding of the planet. There's a lot of data that people are going to be looking at for decades to come. We accomplished so many of our science goals, and we're going to have something to look back on and be proud. And in that report from NASA TV, we heard from Insight's principal investigator, Bruce Bannard, Insight project scientist, Mark Panning, Insight science and instrument operations lead, Elizabeth Barrett, and Insight's deputy project manager, Kathy Zamora garcia This is Space Time. Still to come, scientists working out how to manufacture metal on Mars, and later in the science report, Iran getting closer to building its first nuclear weapon. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists are working out how to manufacture metals on Mars. The process would use concentrated solar energy as a heat source and carbon, which is produced by cooling carbon dioxide gas from the Martian atmosphere and which is a byproduct of oxygen production together with local Martian soil to create metallic iron. Oxygen extraction has already been demonstrated on Mars through the MOXIE program. MOXIE is the Mars Oxygen in Situ Resource Utilization Experiment mounted on NASA's Mars Perseverance rover. The metal extraction process being developed by Swinburne University would be coupled with a future oxygen generation plant, much larger than MOXIE. That should be able to co-produce oxygen with an iron alloy as a byproduct, and that could be used to create metals. These metals could then be used to further human missions and development on the Martian surface. A new study has warned of the increased cancer risk astronauts face due to space travel. While it was always known that deep space missions to Mars would cause a dramatic increase in cancer risk because of the heavy dose of cosmic rays and particles from the Sun, flights in low Earth orbit were considered safer because of the planet's protective magnetic field. However, new research reported in the journal Nature Communications claims astronauts' blood is still showing signs of DNA mutations in blood-forming stem cells even after 20 years. The study has involved 14 space shuttle crews. The authors say the mutations, though unusually high considering the astronauts' average age, were still below a key threshold for concern. They suggest that astronauts should be subjected to periodic blood screening in order to keep an eye on possible mutations. NASA's already looking at restricting long-distance space flights to older, more senior astronauts whose age make them less likely to be impacted by long-term effects. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has found that so-called green laundry detergents, green all-purpose cleaners, green insecticides and green toothpastes can actually be more toxic and less biodegradable than their conventional counterparts. The findings, reported in the journal Environmental Toxicology, looked at tests of a number of so-called green products. These included an all-purpose cleaner, a dishwashing detergent, a mouthwash, an insecticide, a laundry detergent and a dishwasher gel, and they were then compared with two conventional counterparts for each category. Scientists tested toxicology by exposing freshwater organisms to the products, namely daphnids and grass shrimps. And the products were also tested to see how quickly they degraded and how toxic their degraded products were. 
For Daphnids, half of the green products, the mouthwash, the laundry detergent and the dishwasher gel, ended up being more toxic than their conventional counterparts. And just two green products, the dishwashing detergent and the dishwasher gel, became less toxic when they degraded 33.3% compared to 87.5% for the conventional products. Now for grass shrimp, only one green product, the insecticide, ended up being less toxic than conventional products. And the so-called green laundry detergent ended up being far more toxic than either of the conventional green products it was tested against. Iran has reported new technical advances in uranium enrichment as it continues to pursue its clandestine nuclear weapons program. The United Nations nuclear watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency, says Tehran started feeding a new cascade of centrifuges at the Fidel uranium enrichment plant, which has recently been upgraded. The upgrade makes it easier for the Islamic Republic to enrich weapons-grade uranium. Tehran's always denied seeking to produce nuclear weapons. Instead, the oil-rich nation insists its nuclear program is for peaceful power generation only. However, both Swedish and German security services have reported attempts by Iranian agents to obtain technology used for nuclear weapons. And the International Atomic Energy Agency says Tehran's repeatedly refused to adequately explain why it has metallic uranium in its possession whose only use is in nuclear weapons. A new study has confirmed that dogs can develop dementia as they age. The findings, published in the journal Scientific Reports, looked at 15,000 dogs finding common symptoms include memory loss, a loss of spatial awareness, changes in social behaviour and sleep disruption. The authors found that after the age of 10, the average dog's risk of developing a form of dementia known as canine cognitive dysfunction increases by 68% each year. They say there appears to be a link between dogs being less active and a higher canine cognitive dysfunction rate, but more research is needed to determine whether the lack of activity is the cause of the illness. The glittering highlight of the Australian sceptical calendar, the annual Skepticon conference, will this year be held in Canberra, the national capital, at the start of December. Of course, one of the highlights of the event is the highly coveted Bent Spoon Award, which is presented annually to the perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudoscientific piffle. The award is rumoured to have been fashioned out of a piece of gopher wood salvaged from Noah's Ark. Upon its sturdy base is a fixed spoon rumoured to have been used at the Last Supper. That spoon was allegedly bent by Yuri Geller himself using age-old magic energies unknown to modern science. Nominations for this year's Bent Spoon Award are now open. Past winners of this elegant trophy for displaying a total lack of scientific understanding have included the Australian Broadcasting Corporation for their television show The New Inventors, which seriously considered the pseudoscientific benefits of an anti-bio-water conditioning system, which probably should have been filtered through the kidneys a few more times. But I guess that's what a billion dollars in taxpayers' money gets you, with their motto, Never let the facts get in the way of a good story. There's the University of Wollongong for proving once and for all that you don't need to be smart or right or even scientifically accurate in order to get a doctorate. Adelaide psychic Annie Dankbar has won the award for her discovery of the Colossus of Rhodes, which created something of a media frenzy until it was shown to be nothing more than modern builder's rubble. The ABC won the award again for their television show Second Opinion, which promoted so much unscientific quackery they really should have got a few more opinions. Southern Cross Universities won the award for offering a degree course in naturopathy. The CSIRO's Chief Larry Marshall has won the award for his support of water divining. The ABC won the award for a third time for spending taxpayer money on psychic investigators. Racing driver Peter Brock was the Bent Spoon Award winner for his highly touted energy polarizer, which generated more heat in the motoring media than what it did energy in his car. The SBS were also a Ben Spoon winner for their television program Medicine or Myth, which promoted alternative medical treatments as if they had real scientific credibility, as opposed to being nothing more than the occasional placebo effect. The Melbourne Metropolitan Board of Works won the Bent Spoon for hiring a US psychic archaeologist to detect a non-existent electromagnetic photo field, whatever that is. And of course, who can forget Paleo Pete Evans for his promotion of the Biocharger, 
a miraculous device that, according to its manufacturers, has been proven to restore strength, stamina, coordination and even mental clarity. Evans is another dual winner, previously winning the spoon in 2015 for his paleo diet advocacy, which included promoting bone broth as a formula replacement for babies, as well as his campaigns against fluoridation of water and against vaccination. Tim Menham from Australian Skeptic says this year's winner will be up against some stiff competition. Skepticon will be held in uh, Canberra the first weekend in December. It will also, hopefully, all things being equal, be the first face-to-face convention we've had for a few years having the last couple of years been sort of isolated and locked down. So the conventions, we've still had them, but they've all been online. So it'll be at the National Library in Canberra, nice location. A panoply of people, including some uh, senior bods from the European Skeptical Movement, Claire Klingenberg, who's the president of the European Skeptics Council, and people who run the European Skeptics Podcast, nicely abbreviated to ESP, yeah. and a whole other range of locals and things are other speakers, so it should be very good. One of the highlights, of course, is the announcement of our annual awards. We've got good awards to you know, Skeptic of the Year, media awards, we've got uh, an award for good deeds and things, and of course the, the, the really big highlight of highlights is the Ben Spoon Award. Any early number- Nominations yet. We are getting nominations. We've only opened it recently, so they're coming in. But we, we are now heavily promoting it, and we're looking for nominations from any and everywhere. They have to be Australian candidates, and they have to have done something that's sort of particularly outrageous between conventions is basically the way we run it. So from late October last year to November this year, and it's, it's good to have a range, range of people. We've had people like uh, Pete Evans as well, twice actually. So he's, he's very been dishonoured twice. But it goes to the perpetrator of the most preposterous piece of paranormal or pseudo-scientific people, which means someone who's made (laughs) I still get it wrong every time, but uh, it's a highly um, unsought-after award. We actually do have a bent spoon and we have a nice plinth that sits on with all the names of the winners running around, and we've been handing it out since 1982. And no one's ever wanted to keep it. That's right, yeah, they just get the prestige that uh, comes with it. That'll be announced. You've had some illustrious past winners. We have, we have. We actually had the head of CSRO at one stage who was sort of vaguely promoting or we're actually promoting divining, water divining. We've had the ABC has been nominated a few times. That was that's one of the few times. We've had the Pharmacy Guild of Australia. They, they were nominated. Chiropractors, of course, they've popped up. A lot of old med things, but a lot of other things, including sort of there's a fellow who used to make his hand disappear. That was his psychic trick. Um, he basically put it behind a curtain, I think. I forget exactly what it was. But all sorts of people from the funny to the, hmm, rather serious end, end of the scale. University of Wollongong's there. University of Wollongong got it for one of the most error-ridden PhDs ever put out. Yes. Uh, it was an anti-vaccination PhD and it caused a lot of fuss and we've published a, a, a major sort got, of... Uh, has she still got a doctorate? Yeah, she still does, yeah. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, it's handy to have a doctorate when you're talking about medicine, even though it's got nothing to do with medicine. You know, Dr. So-and-so sounds impressive. We did a major report going through the entire sort of PhD and pulling out all the errors, Adam which is a fat a report. a page thesis worthless in two seconds. I think so, yeah. Yeah. And, and it, 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 it worried the University of Wollongong. It sort of didn't help. But they weren't impressed, but they didn't withdraw it, etc. They basically pulled won't, the wagons into a circle. Weren't unimpressed enough. No, they, I don't think they wanted to admit it. They would rather sort of, oh, look over there. <laughs> Steve Novella will be there in virtual Steve Novella. A virtual Steve. Uh, yeah, virtual Steve. He has been to, to Australia a number of times, actually, either alone or with the Skeptics Guide. We're also having Brian Dunning, who'll be the same. Brian Dunning oh, does wow. Skeptoid, yeah. which is That's huge, yeah, yeah. very, very amusing, interesting podcast, that one. So those two will be there. A, a range of people, a lot of them from local, a lot of them from because it is Canberra, and I think as Canberra is a bit of a hub of scientific activity. So there'll be a lot of people from around there as well. The tickets are available now. You can, I think, buy full weekend or one-day tickets, and we're, they're looking at possibly streaming but that will depend on demand. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. 
or by becoming a space-time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial-free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group, and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more Space Time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 